At the Xbox Game Showcase in July, it wasn't Halo or Fable that stole the show. Instead, images of grimy gas mask figures, apocalyptic landscapes, strange anomalies, abandoned cities, and underground research labs caught people's attention. This was the first time that we had seen actual footage from the upcoming sequel to the cult classic PC apocalyptic horror game, Stalker. And despite this being a mostly pre-rendered trailer using in-game assets, it racked up more views more quickly than any of the main Microsoft franchises. But to my surprise, many people who were really excited about what this trailer was showing still weren't quite sure what exactly Stalker was, why the title of the game was in all caps, and why so many longtime fans on PC were so excited to see the return of the franchise. In this video, we're going to take a look at what made the original games such classics with tense, unforgiving gameplay that still holds up to this day. And we're going to compare that to what we have confirmed as far as features go for Stalker 2. Let's see if the sequel has a chance to live up to the incredible legacy of the original franchise. First things first, what does Tucker actually stand for? After all, it is in all caps and must be an acronym. Well, it stands for Scavengers, Trespassers, Adventurers, Loners, Killers, Explorers, and Robbers, which kind of covers the overall kind of people you're going to run into inside of the zone in these games. While overall the Stalker franchise can be described as an open world survival horror FPS game, it definitely borrows multiple elements from RPG games as well, like a deep upgrade system, weapon repairs, and a rather intense inventory management with managing weight, stashes, selling, buying, and trading as well. The original Stalker featured the incredible setting of an alternate reality Chernobyl exclusion zone, the disaster zone around the power plant. With a diverse world full of different mutants, multiple factions of other stalkers or explorers, and a deep connection to some of the most classic Russian sci-fi to come out of the Cold War era. That's part of the reason why I think this game connected so much with me and with others. It combines so many really well done interesting elements. An actual nuclear disaster in an actual location, along with a modified version of the original roadside picnic science fiction novel, and the original famous Russian stalker film. In the Roadside Picnic book, an alien landing site becomes a government-controlled zone of exclusion, with strange artifacts where aliens who have just come through on a quote-unquote galactic roadside picnic have permanently changed this location, and now stalkers are breaking that prohibition and taking strange alien artifacts out from it and selling them for a living. That term stalker eventually came to describe the guide who navigates those forbidden and uncharted areas. And eventually, actual visitors to abandoned sites and ghost towns eventually also called themselves stalker. It was just part of the pop culture. Roadside Picnic, along with its stalker protagonist, would also become a really famous Soviet movie simply called Stalker. And that is where the stalker games heavily borrow from. They take this concept of this exclusion zone and these stalkers who go in and explore this forbidden area, and they combine it with the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine to give it a real world connection, while still maintaining those deep ties to some of the most popular Russian and Soviet science fiction and films out there of that time period. So as you guys can see, from the very start, the Stalker game franchise was a combination of some really fantastic and interesting sources, and that's just the beginning of how these games became something truly special. Before we dig into the technical gameplay aspects of what also added to the uh, incredible depth and immersion in this game, let's briefly thank our sponsor for this video, Olight. Now unlike your flickering and battery-eating flashlights from Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, 
O-lights aren't going to let you down. These are powerful flashlights meant for tactical uses as well as outdoor activities like camping and hiking. They also feature a number of really advanced features like USB recharging, and that includes some of their tactical gun lights. We're finally in the future, guys. You can recharge your pistol light. Make sure you guys click that link right there in the description and check out the Elite sale going on right now, and you'll help support the channel along the way as you do it. So now that we know some of the details and lore behind the Stalker franchise that made it so unique, let's talk about the technical gameplay features that really solidified the immersion in this game. And at this game's core of the entire franchise, all three original games, is the A-Life AI system. The world moved around you, and you felt like a passing witness or participant. The A-Life AI system controlled not only the mutants, but the factions and the battles that would happen when you were off map. You would change zones, going from an abandoned vehicle graveyard into an old abandoned military barracks, and you'd come across firefights between different factions that had already happened when you were elsewhere. Sometimes you'd find groups that had massacred a group of attacking mutants, and sometimes you'd find mutants who had massacred a bunch of stalkers who were on their own. This gave the world a sense of randomness that I really have not seen in any other single-player open-world game you really felt like you were just a participant in what was going on. The randomness also added a high amount of replayability. If you got lucky and found someone's corpse after a mutant attack or a firefight, you might get a couple of high-end guns or bits of gear early on to supplement your starting low-level gear. The tough part, though, would be keeping it repaired and keeping it fed with that hard-to-find ammunition because the game had tons of different ammunition types. Again, bringing in those RPG elements to help supplement the FPS style hard gameplay. Along with the highly rewarding inventory systems with those light RPG elements for med kits and bandages to stop bleeding, you also have the ability to hunt artifacts, these valuable, unusual things only found within the zone. Yet another element of the game design taken from Roadside Picnic and the Stalker film. To find these artifacts, you had to fight and dig your way into the anomalies, the most dangerous parts of the zone, some of which were invisible or were traps of electricity or fire. They were these strange otherworldly traps that added yet another danger as you were exploring the zone. But if you did dip your toes into those anomalies, the ability to find those rare artifacts and sell them to upgrade your gear, to get more food, to get more med kits, really felt like you truly were a stalker exploring the zone. The risk and reward gameplay with those RPG light elements in the stalker franchise were near perfect in their design. It really did feel like the entire environment and all the creatures who were independent of you and doing their own thing were all a danger, and the quick save system wasn't what people now call save scumming, where you try to quick save as often as possible, the quick saves really were a lifeline because you would be so shocked by what could kill you without warning in these games. And that was the thrill. It was so immersive, but also so tense and so dangerous. With complete day-night cycles and some really advanced lighting for 2007 when these games launched, the world really felt like it came alive at night. And if you got caught out in the wasteland, in the zone, without your flashlight or without night vision and darkness fell, you felt like you had made a huge mistake. Because the A-Life system even had different day-night cycles for activities for the mutants, and the more dangerous mutants would come out only at night but also more rare artifacts. I still remember one time all of my batteries died when I was out exploring part of the zone and then darkness fell and I could hear mutants attacking a group of loner stalkers nearby. But I was low on health, low on ammo, and knew without light I was not going to be able to help. So instead of helping, I glitch hopped my way into a tree where I crouched and hid throughout the night until the sun rose, listening to those mutants roam around and massacre other stalkers guys, that is immersion. That is the kind of experience that the Stalker franchise is known for, these little stories of survival and fear, literally hiding within a tree until the daylight breaks. These games are just something special, and Stalker 2 has the potential to make up for the shortcomings of the original, the limitations in technology, and the small team that created these first games 
if they can go all in for Stalker 2, maintain that original feel and atmosphere, upgrade the graphics, and bring it into the current and next gens, we are going to have something even more special on our hands with Stalker 2. So as you guys have seen throughout these screenshots and bits of the trailer, we have seen our first look at Stalker 2 there from the Xbox conference, and the main question that GSC Game World, the developers, had to answer was, is this gameplay footage? And the answer is, kind of, but not really. It's not gameplay, but this is in-engine, in Unreal 4, using the actual art assets, the models and textures and lighting that are going to be a part of the final game. So what you're seeing is little pre-stage scenarios that are mimicking gameplay, but the artwork that you're seeing is what they're working on creating for the final game. And guys, that's impressive. These forests and cities look incredible. The game is going to be releasing on both PC and the Xbox Series X at the same time. I would say that it's probably safe to assume that a PlayStation launch would be coming down the line. The game is going to be open world, much like the original, but whereas the original Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl had to segment their open world because of tech limitations, the devs here in Stalker 2 are aiming to have it as one continuous, seamless open world. They're promising, much like the original, an epic, non-linear story with choices that matter and multiple different endings. We are going to be able to return to some previous areas. You guys saw the classic rookie village there in the trailer but there are going to be new areas as well, which is especially exciting because the original games, because of the smaller teams, had to definitely revisit some of those same areas over and over again throughout uh, Clear Sky, the first sequel, and then Call of Pripyat, the third sequel. Clear Sky especially used almost all of the same levels from the first game. Call of Pripyat expanded things slightly, but it's going to be great to visit some new areas and yet still see some of our old favorites show up once again. Along with it, we can also expect new artifacts, new anomalies, new mutants, and still, the devs are also promising mod support. While the devs for Stalker 2 have left behind their custom-designed X-Ray engine in favor of Unreal 4, some of the devs that worked on the original A-Life systems are coming back to implement new versions of A-Life for Stalker 2. And guys, that is the most exciting news for me right there, because the A-Life system that controlled the factions and the mutants and the day-night cycle and the loot, those systems that worked behind the scenes to make a living world, that's what made Stalker so immersive at its core. And that's why, guys, myself as a longtime Stalker series fan and so many others like me are so excited that we're finally getting our Half-Life 3 here with Stalker 2.